Hi, I'm glad you came. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about software categories and software applications. We tend to think that a lot of the stuff that we use every day is just there. It's somebody or somehow it appeared in my computer and I use it. But the reality is that somebody actually has to build those things. And they are built for a specialized purpose. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's get started. First of all, it's good. It feels kind of good to remember what our lives were before computers. And I like this little graph in here because it reminds me when I was growing up and whenever I wanna be in touch with somebody, I had to actually write a letter and my penmanship was much better back then, okay? However, it required a lot more manual labor, okay? You can remember that in like many, many years ago here in the US when with unions when they started. And there was something called privacy that we probably don't see much nowadays. Now with computers, uh, we have a lot of automated labor that is programmed by somebody and, you know, and we have, sadly, but here it is, we have no privacy. Okay, so we have our life before computers and our life after computers. And uh, sometimes we wish it were like before computers, but let me tell you something, life was much harder because for example, when I wanted to apply to go to, to the university to attend college in Mexico, I could not just log into their website and download an application or fill up an online form. There was no such a thing. So I will have to call them on the phone, ask them to please mail, not email, but mail me an application and then I will fill it up and send it via snail mail. Okay, so remember, when we have email now, people think, oh, mail, email, and, and oh, can you email me? And it's just so convenient and so widely used that we forget about the regular mail. But that one is the snail mail now. And another thing is that keep in mind that that USPS, uh, AKA the, sma the snail mail, is the one that brings you the stuff that you purchase from Amazon. Okay, so let's, let's keep on loving it. Okay, let's continue. So um, when we have problems, we always look at software now that we are very much into technology, right? Te computers are everywhere. So we look at software to come and rescue us. So let's begin by learning the two kinds of software there are. First of all, we have the system software. I would like to call this the invisible software and I'll explain why in a minute. But basically your system software is anything that supports whatever it is that you do in the computer, other software, okay? This supports other software and it manages the hardware where this software is housed, okay? And then we have the application software, which is the one that we actually, we are using to do different things, okay? So uh, let me tell you about that. I call system software the invisible software because whenever you go and buy and purchase a computer and you open it, let's say it's a PC, you open that and wow, there's windows already, there's icons in there, you can click some stuff, you can just put, set up your wireless and go online right away. But what about all that stuff that it's already in there? Who made windows? Who made it possible for you to use your Wi-Fi from your computer? Who wrote that code? How is that code there? Well, all that code that basically supports other things you do, for, here is a, a good example. You have that, co that code that has been written, that software that has been written for you to be able to communicate uh, online, to use a network, okay? That is the part that we don't see, but it's there. That is system software. But then you have your browser. When you go shopping to Amazon or whatever, you go shopping and your browser, you think your browser is connected to the internet, but no, it's actually talking to the system software. So the system software allows you to go online. So the software is, the, the browser is just the part that you're looking at at the very front, but the back end, that is the system software. It's quite important. And as I say, I call it the invisible one because many times we don't give it enough credit because it's just there. We think it's just there. But no, it's not just there. Somebody actually makes it. Let's continue. So speaking of software then, uh, let me talk about some the software application, the application software categories. First, we have general purpose applications and I will be going in detail in each one. 
Then we have specialized applications, that's another kind. And then we have the newest trend, which are the mobile applications. So we're gonna start by talking about the general purpose applications, and here they go. We have word processors, and probably you have seen them in some of your classes when you try to write something in Word, right? Then we have presentation programs, such as the one that I am using right here, which is PowerPoint, and uh, you may have used this if you are presenting something in your class, in your biology class, for example. Then we have spreadsheets, which uh, probably if you're a business major or an accounting major, you probably are very familiar with this. Um, we have database management systems, and uh, data is the most important part anywhere, so Database management systems can help you as well. And we have stuff such as the personal information managers, okay? So, these are general purpose applications. And the reason why they are called like that is because they can have many, many uses. For example, let's think of the word processor. I can grab it and I can make an exam for you, okay? An exam that you're gonna take in my class, in my ICS 100 class. So that will be a, a use for it. But now I may have a friend that is using Word to make a flyer for a charity event that he is hosting, you see? So now the same thing can have several purposes, right? Now, and in a spreadsheet, for example, you, I may use a spreadsheet, Excel, to have the list of my students and their grades, right? Very nice, well, good use for that. But however, you know, somebody else may have the shopping list and the different prices at different stores and then the minimum price so it knows, this person knows where to go shopping, okay? And if you're in accounting, oh well, you can have budgets and things like that uh, within your spreadsheet. So it's just something so general that people can actually use it in many different ways. So I want you to think like that when you think of general purpose applications, okay? Let's move to the next category. And the next category is specialized applications. Now, these kind of applications are focused, like Laulima, for example, right? We don't use Laulima to go shopping. We have, or to do many things. We know that Laulima serves us when we're taking an online class because it's a course management system. And specialized applications are actually useful for something very, very specific. Let's give you an example of this. Um, software system for a restaurant, okay? That's why I had that little girl in the restaurant there. Because if you go to a restaurant and you order your stuff, you know that the waiter goes into the a touch screen and click, 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 and it orders the stuff, the stuff goes into the kitchen, and the kitchen people know what they have to cook, right? So that is software that is only for restaurants, and somebody develops that for restaurants, and it's not something that I am just gonna go buy, and it's not something that can be repurposed. I cannot use that, for example, to teach you the class, okay? So another thing is, for example, those machines that people use, well, big companies, let's say Mars, to make M&Ms, okay? Somebody's gotta design the software to run those things, but it's so specialized that it's only built to, to make M&Ms. It's not like I am gonna buy one of that kind of software, and it's probably quite expensive, so I'd rather buy the M&Ms, okay? Let's continue. So another kind is uh -huh, the mobile applications, okay? And these are usually designed for mobile devices and uh, smartphones and tablets, okay? First of all, I cannot um, miss the opportunity to, in, you know, to put a little commercial in here. If you wanna learn to do these kind of apps, you can IC take ICS 110, where you learn App Inventor, or ICS 136, when you learn Android programming, or ICS 236 where you need, uh, you learn iPhone programming and cell phone security. So we have those courses in here. But that thing aside, right, many apps are built specifically for mobile technologies. Some of them are special for tablets, some of them only for phones. However, there is a big, big uh, chunk of applications that are made for computers and they have a little version for mobile devices, okay? The same is extended when you use browsers. You have a website, usually, and sometimes those websites are used for, um, for, um, for 
regular computers, big screens, right? But then they have a different version. Like it usually starts with M. The URL starts with M. Remember last class we talked about HTTPS? Well, these websites, mobile websites, start with M. For example, m.facebook.com will take you to their Facebook site that is mobile. Okay? So now they are taking care of serving all the different populations, mobile and not so mobile. Okay? Let's continue. So the user interface is the most important part of any application, okay? And the user interface may have windows, which are the squares that you have right in front of you where you have different programs. You probably know at this point what a window is. You have the icons, which are usually in your desktop or in different folders, and you can just double click and something actually happens. That's what your icon is all about. You have menus. Or you can call a menu where you have a list of options that you can choose. And in order to get your menu out from it or to find out if there is a menu, you just need to right click something, either the background or, or the desktop or an icon, and you will get a menu. You have dialog boxes, which are usually those little ads that say warning or like you cannot do that. And usually they, they have a sound when they come out. They are kind of annoying. Oh, but let me just rewind a little bit. In dialog boxes, you also have the printer ones, which are not annoying and they are quite necessary, okay? And you have toolbars, which are exactly what they say. They are bars that have tools, okay? So in the user interface arena, it's very important that whenever we build an application, we have somebody test it. Testing is so, so important because if somebody goes and looks at that and has, is like, oh, where do I click to do this? Or where do I point to do that? That means that your application is not good because it's not intuitive. So it is very important to test, okay? That's the very most important thing because the user interface is quite important. Let's continue. Now, one last thing that I want to tell you about is that there are several common features in Microsoft, and we had been covering, you know, Word. Pete has been working about that. Then I'm going to talk about PowerPoint soon. So he pr has talked to you about ribbons, contextual tabs. He has mentioned those during the class, galleries, and tabs that are not contextual. Contextual tabs are there only when certain elements are highlighted, and regular tabs are always there, okay? With that said, I hope that it's now clear the different kinds of software that we have and how important the user interface is.